Hey guys, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging. Um, today I had a fantastic, fantastic opportunity to speak with the amazing Rodney Habib about um, keto diets and vegetables and what he feeds his dog. Sadly, I was late to our interviews, partly because I was enjoying the gorgeous sunshine here in the Pacific Northwest, not something that I expected today, and partly because I apparently cannot count when it comes to time zones. So I apologize to Rodney for being late. I apologize to you guys that I didn't get as much Rodney as I could have. And I definitely apologize to the people who followed me and needed Rodney on a call after we talked. Anyway, I hope you guys get a lot out of this. I hope you enjoy it. It's a tremendous amount of information and I'm already thinking of things that I can give to my dog just based on the information that Rodney shared with me today. Enjoy. Computer. Okay, so hi Rodney, how are you? Well, hello, Kimberly. How are you? <laughs> it's great to see you. Well, it's great to see you. I'm you're always so punctual, so it's really <laughs> good talking to you today. I like you are Funny. always on time, which is and awesome. And you're the one to talk about punctuality. You're like the busiest man on the planet, so I'm like amazed that I'm talking to you right now. This is this is editing week. It is a crazy week. Like literally, we're what are we like 48 hours away from launch day, and so yeah, man, the nerves are just crazy right now. Well, I feel fantastic. Well, that's great. And you've got this beautiful red background behind you. I so know, you know, right? It's like, <laughs> this is my personality today. <laughs> so I asked my peeps, you know, I said, hey, you know, I'm talking to Rodney this weekend. You guys got some questions? And they did. And of course, because you have this cancer doc coming out, everyone's questions are about cancer. But um, actually, I want to start off with vegetables. And um, with everything that you've learned over the years, how do you feel about vegetables today? What, what did you do? So I just want you to know that I'm not wearing headphones and you're going to get audio backlog. So I, I'll mute my mic when you talk. And if my lips are moving for everyone out there that aren't watching me, it just means I forgot to unmute my mic. Man, I absolutely love vegetables. And I mean, I love vegetables for a million reasons, but I love vegetables um, even more today because of all the science on this journey that we've traveled on. Now, we know that vegetables are very controversial. Of course, in the dog world, we have uh, planet A that says, man, vegetables will kill your dog and they'll absolutely destroy them and dogs weren't eating in the wild and yada, yada, yada. Um, we have, and, and you know, that's a very small percentage of the world. I, I, I know the prey, I, it's usually prey model that say that and they usually make up like 0 0.05 of the of the world population of the feeding we know of course 96 percent is the processed food section and usually those people feed a lot of vegetables and then you've got the other half which is the home preparer and the raw feeders and um, a whole bunch of cool people that uh, everybody's cool by the way um, and you know you have those people that are incorporating vegetables into their diet now we of course we hear all the beautiful things that you know vegetables are full of uh, micronutrients um, you know the phytochemicals and all the wonderful things that are in them. But why do I love them? Yeah. I love them because they actually promote longevity. And not only do they promote longevity, but they're actually a tool used in destroying cancer, in literally virtually uh, shrinking tumor cells. And we have science to back that up. And the person that really schooled me on this is one of my favorite veterinarians and world teachers of all time, Dr. Ian Billinghurst. So to address the cool science, if you ever want to validate how important veggies are, now yeah. I know we're on a time restriction and this could be a conversation that we could have for 450,000 years, but there's actually a way that we can validate the importance of vegetables when it comes to our pets and it comes to ourselves. And this is a really cool test and I urge everyone at home to do this test. Um, it is a beautiful validity test. Here's what we know. We know first and foremost that when you uh, when you have high blood sugars and so if you have high blood sugars or your dog has high blood sugars that's not a good thing there's a lot of science behind high blood sugars meaning uh, a release of high insulin and high insulin means chronic inflammation it means the speeding up of, of aging and it also means insulin is also uh, igf1 <clears throat> is a growth factor so literally uh, it grows you faster um, mm -hmm. but it also cell replicates and so when your blood sugars are high and your insulin is high, uh, you are cell replicating at 150,000 miles an hour. So if you have cancer cells in your body and you're cell replicating those cancer cells, you're in really big trouble. And of course, for aging, it's going to speed up the aging process. Now the test. 
I wasn't prepared to do this, but now I'm going to do this. So this is for $8. You can go to Walmart. I've talked about this before, I think, in a, in a Facebook Live, which is really cool. Go out and buy a glucose reader, right? But also make sure you buy the one that also can tell you to do ketones. Ketones are a whole other subject. I'm sure we'll get on that soon. But you don't, if you can't maybe spend the extra 10 bucks or you're um, financially just not, uh, let's just say flexible right now, just buy the one for eight bucks, Walmart. Little tiny prick. You can get either the dog's ear. I do the inside of the lip for Reggie. That sounds barbaric and it sounds like, I was like, when Dr. Becker did it, I was like, there is no way in the world I'm gonna prick Reggie on the inner part of his lip. They don't feel it. Like literally, she's like, watch this. And she poked him like he didn't even flinch. So a little bit of a poke and you can actually get the levels of where your dog is on, let's say, a fasted belly. So you always want to test your dog in the morning. Okay. Now, here's where the test comes in. This is why I'm telling you this now. Test your dog in the morning. Now, I just so happened, that's my phone. I should probably shut that off. I just so happened to print off a test of my, of my own that I did with Reggie and something that I was going to publish and I, I still have yet to publish. So this is my beautiful boy, Reggie. If you can see him right there, let's see how handsome that little devil is. There's his beautiful raw food diet with vegetables and a, a wonderful sardine right there. Now, Reggie is fat adapted. Now, for a lot of people that don't know what that is, of course, we've got a giant documentary that's coming out that's gonna talk about that. But you can also get that online. There's a thousand places where you can learn that. In fact, let's give people some shout outs on their books. This is a great book, by the way, if you haven't read this. Dr. Lowry sent me this, the ketogenic Bible, which will explain what fat adaptation means. Reggie's glucose levels came in at 44. So that's, that was two hours after Reggie ate. So we wanted to validate, uh, it takes about two hours for the dog to reach its highest peak in blood sugar levels after they eat according to science. So we fed Reggie his raw food diet with vegetables and he came in at about a 44. So, we wanted to then see what would happen if we fed Reggie kibble. Now, nobody has these results yet, actually, Kimberly, and you have these now before the blog comes out. And so um, all your viewers will be able to see this before this information comes out. So we wanted to feed Reggie the number one selling pet food in America, which is pedigree. I broke an eight year streak for this <laughs> test and Reggie did it for the greater good. Um, so I know I got a lot of hate mail on that, man. I can't <laughs> Fed your dog kibble, but listen to all you haters out there. I know some of you have been to McDonald's at least once in your lifetime or had a bag of chips. So, and Reggie's on a huge detox, so he's better now. Um, but look, raw food diet, blood sugars after two hours, kibble after two hours. We tested Reggie. Wow, his blood sugars doubled. Now, keep in mind, when you're fat adapted, your body will protect you from actually even getting higher blood sugar numbers. So if he was actually an already a kibble-fed dog, God knows how high these numbers would have been. Now, let's talk about vegetables. Again, everybody can do this test at home, and I urge everybody to do it. Feed your dog its meal if you're not feeding any vegetables. Test your dog two hours after they ate, and then do this. So to validate the importance of vegetables, Here's Reggie on a kibble diet. Now, what would happen if we took a quarter cup of low glycemic cruciferous vegetables, so I like to use broccoli sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower, as you see there, yeah. on top of the kibble. So we gave him like two cups of kibble in this study, and which actually calorically, it balanced out with the raw because we wanted to do everything by calories, future blog, um, vlog. So <laughs> here you'll see... Um, us putting in a quarter cup of vegetables into Reggie's meal. Now check this out. This was Reggie with a standard bowl of kibble pedigree. And then just by adding a quarter cup of vegetables. Oh, wow. Look at it that. It dropped him 20 points. And so the science behind it is very clear. Veggies are a great source of fiber. Now, of course, if you're, if you're not a vegetable fan, well, then you would have to start feeding things like fur, and you'd have to feed feathers and a copious amount of them because you want that, um, that fiber effect that's in the GI system. When you add vegetables to your diet, the second that they get into inside your, inside your GI system, literally, that fiber slows down the release of insulin. 
And because it slows down the release of insulin, you are lowering chronic inflammation. $8 test to validate the importance of veggies. Oh, very nice. I love it. So now we're going to switch gears. And, um, you know, I got a ton of questions about the keto diet. And the one that really popped out to me was, um, can you feed a keto diet with pre-made raw? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so there's a lot of questions right now about these keto diets. Yeah. First and foremost, you know, so uh, Dr. Becker and I have been lecturing all over the world. We just got back from Orlando where we were lecturing at the cancer conference. Uh, this is really important. The, this ketogenic state, this metabolic state that one can go in is very, very new to the animal world. Mm -hmm. um, but in the human world, there's been so much research and data to come out that um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of mixed information now for a lot of people. A lot of people seem to think that, uh, that there is a specific diet to put yourself into a state of ketosis. Yeah. So ketosis is actually, it's a metabolic intervention. There is no diet. Sure, there are diets to help speed up the process to put you into ketosis. But Kimberly, you can put yourself into ketosis eating chocolate cake. Literally, you can do it if you have a, a huge fasting period after it. So ketosis is a really, really broad, fascinating subject for a lot of people. Uh, there is actually, and me and Daniel over at Keto Pets, the president of Keto Pets, awesome guy. You should get him on your uh, podcast. He would, uh, I'm sure he'd take it up. Very science guy. One of my, one of my favorite all-time guys. And Daniel really put this and highlighted this that he believes that you know, uh, the ketogenic diet is more caloric control than it is any other ingredient that you could po possibly add into that bowl. So could you put your dog into ketosis with a pre-made raw? <laughs> Absolutely you could, right? We just know that there's some foods that make it more difficult than others. And one of the saddest things to me is these people that are trying it, literally because of this documentary that's coming out, I got about 10 million manufacturers and for any that are watching today that have contacted me say, hey, we're gonna come up with a ketogenic kibble and it's gonna be great. Here's the challenge. In order to make kibble, you need sugar, starches, we know this. It is virtually impossible unless you're fasting your dog, let's say maybe you're feeding your dog twice a week or three times a week, it could be done with kibble, but man, you can't be feeding any more than twice or three times a week um, it's really, really, we've tried it. It's really tough to get your dog to produce ketones. So to answer that question with my long winded question, you could put any animal or human being on this planet into a state of ketosis with almost anything. Okay. Okay. So then let me, okay. So as far as I understand, and I have friends like human friends who are like doing the whole keto diet and everything. And one thing that I noticed that they're doing is they're eating a tremendous amount of fat. So yeah. You know, um, animal fat, vegetable fat, um, you know, raw cheese, raw yeah. butter, raw milk. And um, the biggest question that comes to mind is with dogs, isn't there a concern? Like, is that safe for dogs? And isn't there a concern of pancreatitis when you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. That's an awesome question. And that is like the number one question right now asked in the world. How on earth am I going to feed my dog all this fat and not like blow their pancreas up, right? Reality is... First and foremost, uh, why are people going to fat? Well, we know that there's three macronutrients that can fuel your body. You can use um, protein, mm -hmm. and protein is a terrible source of fuel. Protein is a building block. The last thing that you want to do is use protein to fuel yourself. In fact, here's some really crazy science. Um, and you, again, you can validate it with a uh, $8 uh, ketometer or glucometer. Try this at home if you want. Go eat a giant steak or feed your dog a high protein diet. Now, mm -hmm. of course, this is for animals that are in their adult stages and early. There's a lot of science that says um, there is no effect on the body as far as high protein diets when you're young. Why? Because you need protein to grow. You need those building blocks to grow muscles and to grow your hair and et cetera, so on and so forth. When you feed a high protein diet, your body and cancer cells especially, there's, some, there's an amino acid within um, protein called glutamine. Your body has the ability to release more insulin eating a high protein diet than eating a chocolate chip cookie. Oh, wow. It's crazy. I had no idea. And this, was ex this explained to me why literally the tumor was blowing out of the side of my dog when my dog Sammy had cancer. Uh, because automatically I was like, 
well, I'll just reduce the carbohydrates. And that's what a lot of people today are very confused with. There's a lot of people that will actually become frustrated when they see sort of the trailers and the previews that I've been making to the doc. It's only two minutes. You can only explain so much, but people are like, wait a minute. All you're saying is feed a little bit of fat, feed a little bit of protein, cut out the carbs and you're going to reverse cancer. And that man, that couldn't be any, uh, that mixed message couldn't be any more wrong. So to go back here and dial this back for a second, there's three ways to fuel yourself. And we know that protein is one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a terrible, terrible fuel source according to science. And in fact, it can speed up the growth of tumors. It's why the Atkins diet never worked. Remember the Atkins yeah. diet, eat a lot of protein, um, eat some fat, don't eat any carbohydrates. People lost a lot of weight because fat doesn't make you fat, but everybody got sick. Yeah. So the second building block that you can use is carbohydrates. And that's what we're all eating. In fact, carbohydrates are delicious. And everybody who doesn't love carbohydrates and pizzas and croissants and rice and pastas, delicious. And the dogs, 96% of the world population of dogs are fueled on carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And we know that protein and carbs both have the ability to raise blood sugars and release insulin. But one macronutrient that we've been taught for years that would be bad for us bad for our health and bad for our heart is fat. Yeah. And fat has been vilified over the years and rightfully so, because there's two ways to look at fat. If you're on a high carb diet and you're eating a lot of fat, you're in trouble because high carbohydrates in the presence of high fat, your body's going to burn up, try to burn the sugars and it's going to store the fat and you're going to get sick. But high fat in the presence of low carbohydrate and moderate protein now you've got something different going on in your body. And that is sort of the ketogenic diet that people are trying to put together and scientists are putting together that you are safe, according to science, in the presence of high fat, moderate protein, low carbohydrate. You're actually not blowing your pancreas up at that point too. What gets interesting is when you talk to the metabolic doctors over at Keto Pets, the second that you cook the fat, because there's a lot of home prep people that like to cook, right. you damage the fat. Okay. And then they start seeing pancreases blowing up over at Keto Pets. As long as the fats are in a raw, natural state, undamaged from heat, mm -hmm. and you've got a proper balance of fat, low carb, moderate protein, Keto Pets are seeing zero pancreatitis. Okay. So when it comes to the fat, is it animal fat, um, plant based, a combination of the two? Yeah, and that's a great question. So you know how everybody, do you remember that article that came out that said coconut oil was bad for you and it like blew up all over the internet? Man, that study was actually true. It was valid. Why? They gave the, these people in the study group, not only did they give them high sources of fat, they, they were on a high sugar diet. So when, again, when you're on a high sugar diet with high fat, it's a disaster. And that's what makes coconut oil awesome and terrible at the same time. So at Keto Pets, they want to be able to use stable fats. Now, we know there's very good plant-based stable fats because when a fat goes rancid, Kimberly, you, are, you're just going to, you have the ability to cause cancer. There's, we have scientific literature that shows eating rancid fat can cause cancer. It's why it's so challenging for the kibble industry right now to try to make these ketogenic diets because they can't add that much fat to a bowl of kibble right. and you get a hole in the bag and you're going to destroy a dog's pancreas. Yeah. So one of the factors here, one of the most important factors here for a keto pet is, okay, what type of fats can we get that are shelf stable? Yeah. So when we were filming this and hanging out with these guys for over a year, they found a lot of success with coconut oil, as you know, and coconut oil is a plant-based oil. It's very shelf stable and you really can validate the, uh, your dog's blood values and your dog will also has the ability to produce nutritional ketones. We'll talk about those in a minute um, on, uh, on coconut oil. Uh, my dogs aren't huge fans of coconut oil, uh, and I know a lot of dogs around the world aren't either. Um, it's a very strong taste after a while, and literally in some of these diets, when Sammy was in a really bad emergency state and you really got to go running to fat, I was using like seven tablespoons of coconut oil at one point um, in order to try to get all of her calories from fat to keep her blood sugars low and to starve those cancer cells. So long story short, you can use MCT oil. And so the MCT oil is almost like the curcumin and the turmeric. You know, we all feed turmeric trying to get to the curcumin. We know there's 4% curcumin in a big giant jar of turmeric. So uh, we know there's a lot of benefit to that spice, but some dogs have an aversion to that spice and they get sick of turmeric paste. You go to a curcumin, the spice is gone, the dogs will start to consume it. So you can kind of waver back and forth. There's a lot of science on which is better and which isn't. And I try not to get in all that. 
I love food and I try to stay with whole foods as much as I can. Um, but you can feed your dog MCT oil if your dog has an aversion to coconut oil. My guys have, hate coconut oil, so I give them MCT oil. Uh, you can use grass-fed butter. I mean, who doesn't love butter, right? So I find an organically, ethically uh, sourced uh, version of a grass-fed butter. Mm -hmm. I usually go to my local farmer's markets. My guys love it when I add butter to their food. Remember, high fat in the presence of high carbs, a disaster. Don't go adding butter to like kibble diets and things like that. You will really hurt your animal. You want to high fat, moderate protein, low carb. You've got to make sure you've got those ratios going like that. Uh, cottage cheese, cream cheese. It sounds crazy to me when they were telling me, I'm like, you guys are putting cream cheese in the dogs? Like, again, when you live on this sort of ancestral mindset, where on earth were dogs eating cream cheese from in the wild, right? Now, remember, these ketogenic diets are 120-day protocols. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a long-term thing. And I'm sure one of the questions that you and I would yeah. be addressing is how long could you actually stay in ketosis for, right? Um, and so that, that, that is very important for people to understand. This is a 120-day protocol. If you've got a dog that seizures, mm -hmm. um, these diets are stopping seizures dead in their spot. I mean, you should see the, if you get a chance, Google um, the TED Talk by Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, who's with NASA right now mm -hmm. um, on starving cancer cells and how they've had the ability to stop seizures. So if you've got a dog that's epileptic, if you've got a child or a family member at home that's epileptic, try putting them in ketosis. Um, any type of chronic inflammation, obesity, diabetes, you can reverse diabetes in two weeks. Um, you, there's a lot of wonderful things that you can do with these diets and the fats to go back. You can see, man, I can talk about this forever. <laughs> you asked one question and I haven't even stopped blabbing because I know we only got so much time. Um, but you, there's so many fats out there for my guys. I'm mixing between like MCT oils, um, swap back and forth with coconut oil. If you want, you can use olive oil. I know there's a lot of fallacy out there that Omega sixes are high in coconut oil and olive oil. Incorrect statement. In fact, just going to the USDA data banks, there's like a little bit of omega sixes and a little bit of omega, uh, uh, excuse me, sixes in coconut oil and in olive oil. There's not that much. In fact, research and study shows that when you give a dog sardines, ask Steve Brown for this data, it's phenomenal. When you give a dog sardines, if you can get it marinated in olive oil, there's a better absorption because of the fat driving that up into the brain which is phenomenal. It's just expensive. Um, so you can, you, you can use fish oils, you can use sardines, you can use duck fat, you can use beef tallow. Um, my gosh, the list goes avocado oil. I know there's a lot of controversy with avocados and dogs, but that's like the pit in the skin, yeah. which has the person, but the oil itself is fine. Keto pets have been using the oil for years with no issues, reversing cancer in animals. Um, so you've got a lot of plant sources you can use so whatever you have accessibility to at home you might want to use when you've got a dog that's dying who has hemangiosarcoma kimberly you <laughs> you're lucky if you got 60 to 80 days tops before it wipes that dog out so you need to start rushing to fats that your dog is going to eat because nine times out of ten they don't have an appetite so to sit there and to be picky about your fats and talk about ethics while your dog is dying in front of you uh give something to your dog that they enjoy yeah. and are you taking Pro, like, are you replacing protein or are you adding this in addition? hundred percent. Yeah. And so that is so, that is so awesome that you asked me that question. You know, I had a, I had a printout that I, I wish I had, but I don't, I don't know if you can see my cell phone on a, on a screen. These were my, uh, my slides that I was going to use. Hold on here. Maybe. Yeah. There. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is that zooming in now? Yeah. Is it reversed? Or no, it perfect. Okay. So you can see there that there's different ratios depending on the emergency situation that you need. Mm -hmm. So you've got a two to one ratio, a one to one ratio and a, and a 0. 0.5. Mm -hmm. And so it means that two grit. So when you're looking at your calories for every two grams of fat that you use in a, in a, uh, so that zoomed out, but yeah. for every two grams of fat you use in, um, or for every two grams of fat, sorry, you use, you use one gram of protein okay. plus combination combined. Cool. I have a better sheet. Maybe I'll send it to you. And I don't know All if right. you have a video over this. So you, you have to, it, this is, it's a balancing measuring act of calories. Here's what's cool. Okay. First and foremost, you can always call Keto Pet. Keto Pet are beautiful people who are accepting phone calls. They're a little bit inundated and they're going to kill me for saying this <laughs> on, on, on a live podcast with you here because um, they are getting flooded with calls. There's no question. And there's a lot of people like, well, hey, man, they didn't return my call. Well, there happens to be like 80, uh, 70, 60 million, whatever the latest statistic is of dogs in America. And there's a lot of people calling there. I mean, literally, they're inundated with phone calls. The second thing is, of course, um, 
I'm not trying to sell the documentary in any type of way possible, but we did film a one hour how to in this okay. documentary to teach people how to put their animals into ketosis with a one hour FAQ to take a little bit of pressure off of keto pet. Um, but then there's also some great resources out there and there's some great people out there and some keto coaches um, who have the ability and to help you gauge your calories properly. Because okay. yes, it can be confusing in some of these ratios like if you need it, you're in an emergency state, you're going into like a four to one diet, do not do this at home without talking to a professional. You're feeding 90% fat at that point and 10% of your, uh, your other calories are coming from the combination of protein plus carbohydrate. 120 day protocol, it is doing some unbelievable things right now in science. Okay, final question. Um, what do you feed your dog? Like give yeah. me an example of a meal. Yeah, you know, my dogs get a variety of meats. I try to stay to the cleanest meats possible. I know there's a lot of research right now. There's a lot of, um, we know that a lot of people want to get sort of eyeballs on content. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, money is no longer the big currency. It's attention. What can I post to get attention, right? Everybody wants attention, and that is the new currency today. Yeah. And so one of the big things is you're seeing a lot of trend right now, people destroying chicken online. And if you eat chicken, your dog's going to die. It's the yeah. end of the world. There's no question that chicken can be extremely dirty. There, there's no question. And we know that chicken's like extremely high in omega-6s, of course. But we know chicken is economical. And we know for a lot of people that have no money um, or that are just really like restricted budget-wise, chicken is something that I try to tell people, if you have to come in and come out of it, or if you have to stay on chicken for a little bit longer than normal, go to the farmer's market. Yeah. Talk to the farmers. I've had one-on-ones with farmers who tell me, look, man, my chickens actually go outside and peck on grass. They're eating worms. There's like no soy. There's no corn. Uh, they're just naturally raised chickens. We, there was a, a terrible article that came out here in Canada where they were giving chickens like Benadryl and caffeine pills and all of these terrible things to try to get the chickens to eat more so they could grow them faster. Yes, that is there. Um, is there, is there, you know, is there a risk of buying, um, there, we know there's a lot of toxins in chickens too, the way they grow chickens, but it's the same thing in our meat source. Yeah. And it's one of the biggest reasons why I gave up meat uh, many years ago after the world health organization posted, Hey, eat a lot of these tainted meats, increase your risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. And so for my guys, it's really important to me that I go, I make BFS with a farmer. Um, you know, many years ago, I, man, I was like literally scooping ice cream for a living. So I had no money. And I didn't know how I wanted to feed my dogs. And I go to the supermarket where you, it'd be like 5 to $10 for a pound of meat. And you know, I don't have to tell you, I got this like wonderful book. I don't, well, here it is here. I got this wonderful book where I learned all of these glorious <laughs> things in this book here. That's like an awesome book for anybody that doesn't have it. Buy this book. Um, but one of my favorite places to go, and I did a lot of this when, uh, when I would do uh, uh, online lectures with Dogs and Actually Magazine, was abattoirs. Uh, I learned that very quickly, and abattoir is another name for slaughterhouse. It's a terrible term, and I like abattoir way better. Um, but when I would go and price my meat, I could get my meat for like 25 cents a pound, 25 cents a pound at the abattoirs, uh, pending on the week. So. If you're really smart, you'll go into the abattoirs on days that they got really uh, on, on big cut days that they call it. it sounds terrible, but on days that they really that they're cutting up a lot of meat because they have a lot of uh, the waste, which is beautiful meat. Um, and I started to learn terminology when I would go to the butchers like I would ask for the bark uh, and the bark would be the inner part of the leg of the cow. Literally, it, you'd have to marinate that for like two years to be able to chew through it as a human. And the farmers were throwing it in the garbage. And it was beautiful, grass-fed, ethically raised meat that my dogs, like my dog Reggie doesn't chew. No dog, hardly any dog chews. They just swallow their food. I was getting that for 25 cents a pound. Wow. And so make friends with the butcher. Talk about the different cuts and the different slang and terminology that you have in your hometown. So when you go into these butchers, rather than just walking in unannounced um, and, hey, I'd like to buy some meat, you're going to get charged. But if you can nonchalantly go in there, ask for their cut days, ask for what they're throwing away, what they have, this is beautiful meat. Like I'm telling you, it's just humans wouldn't want it because it just doesn't look so pretty. That's how I was buying foods on a budget. Um, and so to go back to your question, which was, what do you feed your dogs? <laughs> um, today, because of, uh, because of the, the things that I've learned, because of the analysis that I do, 
this is big. Um, this is really big. And I urge everybody out there to oh, wow. do that. Kimberly, for $30, analyze your food for the love of God, if you have the ability. Yes. For $30, you take your diet. And here, I always want to know, like, what's, uh, what's selling in my hometown and our dogs getting uh, what they need for nutrition. And so literally you can just, um, just want to make sure I'm not calling somebody out here, some big manufacturer, but I test everybody's food. Right. And, and if, I don't know if you can see this, but literally it'll break down like moisture, protein, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, uh, manganese, oh, nice. all of these things for like, in fact, one of my colleagues is here. We'll do it for $25. So it's anywhere between 25 to $50. If you want to validate if your dog is actually eating the right thing, then you can validate that. And you can validate that by going to an agricultural university. Um, there's about three or four testing facilities in the United States that I like to use. Uh, it's, very, it's very, very inexpensive. My dog blew both of her knees at a very young age. I was feeding her a prey model diet and um, I never had my food analyzed. And when I finally um, when I finally met Steve Brown, the world leading formulator who schooled me very quickly. And he's like, man, your diet is eight times deficient. In manganese. Manganese. Right? <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't I know feeding, that one. Right. And so I was like, well, where on earth am I going to get manganese? Uh, how do you, first of all, how do you know my diet's deficient in manganese? He said, have you ever analyzed your food? So I went and analyzed my dog's food. And all you got to do is you can go on. Now we know that AFCO is a bad word, but at least it's a guideline Mm -hmm. As terrible as it is, if you're below that, then you are really in a shitty position if you can't even meet AFCO's terrible standards, right? So at least AFCO is a lousy guideline that you can say, okay, well, I'm going to destroy that because I'm feeding raw food. Right. I was coming under that because I was feeding just these meats that I was buying from Joe Shady that I wasn't balancing properly or that I, and I didn't have analyzed. I ended up my dog, my poor dog, ended up blowing both of her knees, manganese deficiency. Um, and these are things that we learn as pet owners. So to get to your question, <laughs> I feed my dogs. Um, today, my dogs will get a, like a lot of llama, uh, camel. You got to be careful where you search your camel from. Um, and I try to get like eccentric meats or things, uh, venison, things that are low deer, like in my hometown that I know are very clean, that I know they're ethically raised. I always try to source happy, healthy animals. Yeah. Because like I said, factory farming today is a huge, huge issue, right? But if you're on a dime, um, going to your abattoir or to your slaughterhouse would probably be your best bet. That's one of the, one of the greatest tips that I can tell somebody. I was buying, like, like I said, great choices of cuts for hardly any money. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rodney. Well, it was awesome. I'm so sorry I'm rushed. I literally got no, to get editing. I, I'm sure I'm going to see this when this comes out and be like, oh, man, I finished my <laughs> Right now, I'm so panicked. There's a five-part mini-series that's coming out for the world, and, and we just want to make sure everything is going to be perfect for people. And, and it will be. Uh, It'll be amazing. We're very, like I said, this is one year in the making, and I'm super, super excited, and I really, really hope this changes a lot of people's lives. It will. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for having me, and hello to all your followers and everybody, and uh, sorry I talk so fast. Yeah, that's okay.